Hello everyone, welcome to Positron Academy and today we will discuss something about the clinical nuclear medicine. So today's topic of discussion will be on the basics of glucose transport and uh, the mechanism of FTG uptake by cells. So as of we know that glucose is an important uh, metabolite for living organism and also an important carbon supplier for the synthesis of tissue ingredients and also for energy producing metabolic process and all this thing depends solely on the glucose presence. So now we can understand how important glucose is. So in this metabolic uh, diagram we can see glucose is being converted to pyruvate in a process called as glycolysis and during the process ATP and NADH are being produced and although the amount of ATP produced is quite less and the NADH produced over here will go to the electron transport chain for further production of energy. And the spider weight thus produced over here, and if mitochondria is available and also, and also oxygen is available, this will be further used for converting pyro weight to acetyl CoA, which becomes a part of the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, uh, which also lead to higher production of energy by means of oxidative phosphorylation. So now these the cells which don't have mitochondria cannot go for this process over here, so they have to rely on other process. For example, they they convert pyro weight to lactate example of the cell which do for the process is the red blood cell which convert pyruvate to lactate so this pathway as a whole this glucose to pyruvate pyruvate to lactate is important pathway for cancer uh, cell and we will discuss in the in the subsequent uh, slides now um, all the cells uh, are have a glycolytic pathway and this glycolytic pathway occurs in every cells and the cytosolic part of the cells have all the enzymes which are important for uh, for, for, for the uh, glycolysis. So for these glucose has to be transported inside the cytosol. But glucose is a hydrophilic molecule and it, and it cannot cross the hydrophobic lipid bilayer. And moreover this, uh, this lipid bilayer are not leaking to glucose. Fine, so there should be some mechanism which should help transporting glucose from outside to inside the cell. And that is being done by means of the carrier proteins which facilitates glucose in transporting them to inside the cell. And now the glucose enters the cell. Now enzymes are available over here and this enzyme further breaks down glucose to, to derive energy out of it. So these carrier proteins, how they work basically, they have a binding pocket over here. Glucose binds in the binding pocket and uh, the, after binding, the uh, carrier protein uh, goes through a series of conformational changes which results in uh, release of the uh, glucose in the inside the cell and this glucose transport is very important because cells need glucose and this transport can be either of facilitated diffusion like this one or can be an active transport which requires ATP for its transporting process. So now, now these glute transporters are being present on almost all the cell types and they have defined uh, they have uh, there are different iso isotypes of the glute transporters like glute 1 glute 2 glute 3 glute 4 glute 5 glute 7 and what these glute transporters are basically they are the channels by which the glucose can be transported inside the cell and what they are doing basically they are making the cell more permeable to glucose otherwise they are not permeable because the glucose is hydrophilic in nature so now let us discuss something about uh, the transporter, uh, uh, which are the glute transporters. So this glute 1 and glute 3 are the glucose transporters which are present on most of these tissues. And why they are present? They are present for the vessel uptake of glucose. And these glute transporters, glute 1 and glute 3, they have high affinity uh, to glucose and also bind strongly to glucose and also they can transport glucose even when the blood glucose level are low. So for example there is a cell over here and if the blood glucose level are poor but still these transporters can transport glucose inside the cell. So they are the vessel transporters which transports glucose even if the blood glucose level are low. Now the next is about the GLUT4 transporters and uh, these are present on uh, the adipose tissue and the skeletal muscle and uh, they are inducible uh, GLUT transporters and they are expressed uh, when they are insulin. For example, the skeletal uh, muscle over here and there are some amount of GLUT transporters over here, GLUT1 and 3 maybe suppose and if the blood glucose level shoots up then uh, these are uh, this high blood glucose cannot be taken up in the cell because they are uh, lesser number of receptors and what 
the pancreas does the beta cells of the pancreas secretes insulin which binds to the uh, skeletal muscle over skeletal cells over here and results in over production of glut 4 receptors over here and through this over produced uh, glut 4 receptors all the high glucose levels or high the, all the glucose enters the skeletal muscle so these food 4 transporters have increased the permeability of the cell to glucose that's the main role of the glut transporters to make the cell more permeable because glute glucose are one of the most important ingredients for uh, running a cell uh, next is about glute 2 uh, transporters they are the two way transporters that is the same uh, that the same uh, transporting protein can let glucose in the same transporting proteins can let glucose out also from the cell examples being the hepatocytes like uh, when the glucose levels are high the hepatocytes take up the glucose and make a polymer of it called its glycogen and when the glucose level in the blood are low these hepatocytes um, break down glycogen to make glucose and release it back to the bloodstream and there's something how glute 2 receptors work and glute 5, glute 7, glute 5 are present on the small intestine uh, for transporting fructose and glute 7 are present on endoplasmic reticulum. So now over here we can have a brief idea how glucose transporters uh, work basically in our body and their, mechanism, uh, their mechanism of actions and how uh, and at what site they are present at the highest concentration. Now next, next is on active transport mechanism that is sodium dependent glucose transporter that is these are those glucose transporter that are dependent solely on the sodium and in this case sodium acts as a cofactor for the same for the active transport of glucose across the intestinal and the kidney epithelial cells and how this process goes on sodium enters the cell down its electrochemical gradient and when sodium enters the cell down its gradient it also co-transport glucose. And whatever uh, glucose, uh, whatever sodium has been uh, is being uh, is being has accumulated inside the cell, these are being cleared by means of sodium potassium ATPase pump. And there are different types of sodium dependent glucose transporters like SGLT1, SGLT2, like that of these two transporters. There are different types of forms of SGLT1, SGLT2. Now we have discussed a lot about glucose transporters. Now let us move towards the implements in part of view. Now let us have a look about the structure of D-glucose and the FTG, which means the fluorodeoxyglucose. And if you look at the structure of glucose and this structure and these structures are quite identical except at this position. And uh, in, the, in this case of D-glucose, it has a hydroxyl group, but in case of FTG, it has an F18. And this F18 is a proton rich nucleate which decays by emitting a positron and this positron finally annihilates with an electron produces two gamma ray photons having energy 511 keV and these gamma ray photons have been detected by the camera and we use for reconstructing medical images fine so now have a look on this uh, diagram over here so the blood transports glucose as well as FDG and glucose is taken by the cell the same way uh, by means of the glucose transporters we discussed before and once the glucose is being transported is being taken by the cell by means of glucose transporters it's being phosphorylated by an enzyme called as hexokinase and once this enzyme is, ph is phosphorylated this glucosic phosphate enters the uh, glycolytic pathway and finally gets energy out of it and in the same way this uh, like glucose FDG is also transported uh, to the cell by means of uh, the glucose transporters and also and, uh, also, and also once FTG is inside the cell, a phosphate radical is being transferred to the FTG by means of an enzyme called hexokinase and FTG becomes FTG6 phosphate. But the next step for the process of glycolysis is FTG6 phosphate has to convert it to a ketone sugar derivative. Like these are the aldo sugar, so they have to convert it to ketone sugar. And for the, and for the derivative to happen, it requires the presence of the second carbon OH. But why does these FDG don't have second carbon OH? So the further processing of uh, this FDG six phosphate cannot occur, and this FDG cannot be used for um, getting energy. And and in some ways, FDG six phosphate get metabolically trapped inside the cell. And moreover, addition of phosphate group has make it very polar, and it cannot leave the cell now. So the uptake and retention of FDG uh, depends on the level of glycolysis at the site. And uh, this and the FDG capacity is being widely used for diagnosis, for staging, for monitoring of response therapy, and also for detection of recurrence in case of cancer. Now, what's the basic uh, uh, phenomenon by which cancer, tech, uh, cancer cell takes up glucose? 
So if we look at the healthy epithelial cell, they have a defined levels of the glute transporters for the basal activity. Fine. Uh, but uh, but when it when the cell get transformed to a cancerous epithelial cell, then the metabolic demands keep on increasing because uh, these cancerous cells are heterogeneous in nature. They are highly uh, they are highly proliferating in nature, and if they are highly proliferating, their metabolic demand will increase, and also they require higher amount of sugars, fatty acid, amino acid for serving energy to this, to those cells for which uh, for those cells, and also. The cancerous cell has a defined metabolism, which is higher than that of the normal cell. And uh, cancer cell depends solely on uh, the glucose metabolism for energy production. And as you know, that in case of uh, a healthy epithelial cell, the, there are defined amount of glucose transporters, and the glucose uptake uh, is a rate limiting step because of uh, the saturation kinetics. And cancer cell need more glucose. So what they does basically because they don't they, because they don't want a rate limiting step over here. So what they do they over express the glute transporters. Fine and within uh, and thus uh, they take glucose with an elevated rate to fulfill that metabolic demand. And also uh, the cancer cell has more amount of or elevated more or, or elevated levels of the hexokinase. Uh, which converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate and once glucose 6-phosphate is reformed, it cannot, it has to go through the glycolytic pathway. So that's the main thing which these uh, exokinase uh, cancer cells are doing. They are trying to capture all glucose to make them useful in the metabolic pathway. And these are the transporters which are overexpressed expressed in different cancer. For example, GLUT1 is being uh, is being expressed in various tumors, GLUT2, uh, which are overexpressed expressed in uh, liver cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, gastric cancer, and so on and so forth. So this is a table which tells you which transporter is expressed at which cancer, and so on and so forth. The next is an important effect which you call is the Warburg effect. So as we know, in case of normal cell, the glucose has been taken up by the cell, uh, which is further being used to make uh, pyruvate, and this pyruvate goes through the mitochondrial metabolism, and also through oxidative phosphorylation to make more amount of energy fine over here and also in case of anaerobic condition this uh, pyruvate is converted to lactate and which, lead, which yields lower amount of energy fine but in case of cancer what they do they basically convert glucose to lactate instead neutralizing that that for mitochondrial metabolism and oxidative phosphorylation so there's something happens in cancer that they utilize glucose to lactate that's 85 percentage of them is being used uh, is being converted to lactate and that's we call is the Wardbug effect and this is evident from this graph that uh, that uh, these people have used uh, this hyper pad over here the what they have done they have uh, labeled pyruvate with c13 and uh, and also transported inside the cell by means of transported mct and uh, these uh, and these and these c13 pyruvate is being uh, is being converted to c13 lactate by means of enzyme ldh or lactase dehydrogenase and this lactate expression can be seen in this profile so this spectrum tells you that the expression of lactate is higher in case of cancerous cell now the now the factors which influence the ftg uptake so if the factors which influence ftg uptake can be because of the increased proliferation which lead to metabolism increase and also if metabolism increase the need higher amount of glucose so what they do they go for expressing GLUT or the GLUT receptors. So these GLUT receptors uh, result in increased transport of glucose and also the FDG uptake is higher in case of the cancerous cell. So for example, for angiogenesis, they also secrete some of the growth factors which you call as VEGF, which, includes, uh, which lead to increased perfusion and also lead to improved FDG uptake. And if the cancerous cell are hypoxic in nature, they secrete a factor called as HIF1, we call as hypoxia inducible factor 1. And this factor in turn activates GLUT expression and the VEGF expression and lead to increased FDG uptake. So this uptake is responsible by multiple factors like metabolism, hypoxia, endogenesis are the factor which can influence higher FDG uptake. And these are some of the clinical scenarios. Uh, these are the PET scan of a patient with a known colon cancer. And you can see over here the patient has metastasis on the uh, on the liver, and these are those cells which have which are expressing higher number of the glute transporters. And because of the transporting, because high transporters are being expressed on the on the cell surfaces of these of these cells, they are, they are uh, intaking more glucose than other cells. We can see these cells have basal uh, basal uptake of the glucose, but these cell has increased 
or enhanced glucose uptake. So these are those cells which are highly metabolically active, or we can call those cells the metastatic lesion over here. Also, we can see some of the abdominal lymph nodes over here, which do have some increased FDG uptake. And this is a patient with uh, with osteogenic sarcoma. We can see uh, intense uptake of the tumor over here. And these are the patient uh, who had uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. And you can see some of the axillary lymph nodes over here. And also uptake also can be seen in the PET scan. And, uh, and that's the scan post chemotherapy. And you can see there is no uptake over here. So that's an example of complete uh, therapy response over here. So this indicates a definite good response to therapy. And that's the way how pets, uh, the how FTG can be used for disease monitoring, disease uh, progression, disease, disease recurrence and many things more. And thank you for watching the video. If you like the video, please like, share and subscribe and stay tuned with me for more videos.